Hello, I'm Thiago Davi Curi Buzarello. I'm here with Professor Marcelo Aloy Simões. Professor Marcelo has a great career in power electronics, power system, and machine drives. I'm here to talk to Professor Marcelo a little bit about the artificial intelligence, a little bit about the history, how Professor Marcelo started working with this technology. I'd like to hear also more about some books, papers, applications that we can see nowadays. But let's start presenting Professor Marcelo. Professor Marcelo is was born in Brazil, but in, 20, in, in, in the year of 2020, 2000, moved to the United States to work as a professor at the Colorado School of Mines, where he worked for more than 20 years. Professor Marcelo is a pioneer in, in applications of artificial intelligence in power electronics. So uh, now Professor Marcelo is working at the University of Aza. I had a uh, chance to work with Professor Marcelo since 2014. And I already watched some of your classes, Professor Marcelo, in which you talk about artificial intelligence, the history. I really like the way you teach the history of artificial intelligence, how things was evolved little by little. So let's start with a little talk about your career, how the, a little bit about the history of artificial intelligence and when you start working with artificial intelligence in power electronics. Okay, thank you, Thiago. Thank you, everyone who is here watching us. It's a pleasure to be here and to talk a little bit about uh, AI in power electronics and career opportunities and I hope this could be a good motivation for all. Okay. In my case, uh, I had my uh, bachelor's and my master's degree at the University of São Paulo at the Escola Politecnica in the electrical engineering department. So there was a time I was already teaching in the uh, newly formed uh, mechatronics uh, program and I was deciding to do my PhD. And I started my PhD actually at the University of Sao Paulo, but my dream was to go somewhere, to work with someone and have some new experience. Hey, sorry to interrupt you, just to have a short talk. You started your PhD in Brazil, right? In electrical engineering. Yeah, but it was just a few school, a few courses. But what was your target initially in power electronics? I mean, what what area of power electronics you were looking for? Your PhD, a uh, red artificial intelligence no, or, no, or any other no, stuff? No, I finished my master in 1990. And in 1990, in the second semester, I start taking classes. I took maybe two courses only in my PhD and I was starting that time. My real interest was uh, motor drives. Drives. Yeah, because my master was in uh, power electronics, but pretty much DC DC converters, modern you know, DC DC converters. And in my, how to say, in my idea to learn more at that time, I really want to understand uh, electrical machines modeling, controls of electrical machines. So I took some courses at the University of Sao Paulo, the Escola Politecnica in the unified theory of electrical machines. Uh, did, did you heard about, did you hear about artificial intelligence applications in water drives or it was not, not, not when not, you came to United States? No, not in the course, okay. But in the department of mechatronics, it was not a department yet. It was just an emerging course. So we are starting the program of mechatronics in the mechanical engineering department. And we used to receive uh, visiting professors. Uh, many of them were from Japan, but there were some from Spain and even Portugal. And I remember that time, just to want to picture this, that time in Brazil was 1990, 1990 1991. The best computer was a uh, IBM PC XT or IBM PC AT, you know. So that was the kind of uh, 
computational capabilities we had on the desktop, okay? And people are still working with some microprocessors and microcontrollers that were 8 bits or 16 bits. So everything was very raw compared to what today we have. But that time we had some visitors from Portugal and we had some discussions about uh, the Portuguese is intelligence artificial, uh, intelligence artificial, artificial intelligence. And I remember I attended, but it was very much uh, software. Okay? At that, that time, that motivated you to study? A little bit, not much. Not much no, at that no, time? No, not much, a little bit, because the discussions was using Lisp or Prolog, which are language. And even though I liked programming, I like uh, computer programming, I like uh, mathematical formulations on computer, I am not really a programmer in nature, but some people were doing that. They, they were using Lisp and Prolog to do what we call expert systems. So artificial intelligence at that time, at least uh, in Brazil, São Paulo, was more expert systems, uh, systems specialists, expert systems. So I was kind of interested, but not very much, a little bit. There was a friend who just came back from uh, UK. He was finishing his uh, PhD and he was starting to study fuzzy logic. So he told me about fuzzy logic and I was interested. And we had this second uh, seminar in electronic and potential, something like that, second seminar in power electronics, which was in Santa Catarina organized by the university that you work now. Yes, uh, yes. Universidade Federal de Santa Catarina by the group of Professor Ivo Bart. So I was there and it happened two things in that meeting. First, I met someone who was working with vector control and he was doing everything using analog circuits. Vector control for what? For induction power? motors. Induction motors, yeah. right. And he was from Argentina. He was working with Professor Watanabe in Federal Rio de Janeiro. University of Rio de Janeiro. So it was nice to, to see that because I was studying machines, also, okay, electrical machines. And there was a person who I met like one or two years before from Itajuba, Professor Luis uh, Eduardo Borges da Silva. I hope this is the full name, but Borges da Silva, Luis Eduardo. I call him Luis Eduardo. He was at uh, uh, Itajubá, it was the School of Federal Itajubá at that time. And he, he had finished his PhD in Canada and he did some programming of a fuzzy control using Fort. Fort is a language, it's a very powerful language, but very concise, so he did a compiler that could compile rules for fuzzy logic, explain me. So I, these things start to pop up from time to time, you know, uh, expert systems, artificial intelligence. Nobody talked about neural networks at that time, okay? At least not in Brazil. Uh, we heard about neural networks like if it was something that was not really realistic, but nobody talked about that. And I invited Professor Bose, Bimal K. Bose, to come to São Paulo to give a seminar. And there was a foundation at uh, the Escola Politécnica da Universidade de São Paulo called F FDTE in Portuguese, FDT. And with F FDTE and also the support of uh, uh, I think there was a donation of uh, somebody, but we, we, we got money to bring Professor Boos and he gave a course, three days course, where we had uh, a lot of people taking that class. It was wonderful because my English was terrible. Maybe it will never be excellent, but that time was terrible. So I had some difficulty in communicating with Professor Boos because I was just, you know, starting my life as a researcher. And in his course, in his course, it was a three days course, he taught about power electronics, high power converters. On the last day, he talked about applications and he started to say about uh, possibilities of expert systems and artificial intelligence in power electronics. I was very motivated with uh, Professor Booz. And I was starting my PhD and I asked him, uh, what happens if I apply to go to your University of Tennessee? He said, that would be nice, we can maybe continue some work in fuzzy logic. 
assinar. So that's what Professor Bozzi wants to do, to do fuzzy logic. And I was still in Brazil. So I had to, you know, study, uh, to pass the TOEFL and GRE and be accepted in university. And I got uh, uh, funding to visit the uh, University of Tennessee in Knoxville in February 1991. And when I was there, I finalized my application. I talked to the committee. I had taken my, 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 my exams. So when I came back to Brazil in March 1991, after this uh, short visit of three weeks, uh, I received the acceptance at the end of March or April in 1991. Okay, and then I pretty much quit uh, my PhD program in the University of São Paulo because I started a new one. So if I took two or three courses, I I basically didn't use that anymore. And I request a leave of absence because I was an instructor. I just finished my master, so I was starting my career as a professor in Brazil, but I decided to have a leave of absence. And I went to the University of Tennessee with my family, my wife, my son, and my daughter in August 1991, so it was in that year. And I joined University of Tennessee. When I joined University of Tennessee, I had meetings with Professor Bose. He told me about fuzzy logic. He was really motivated with fuzzy logic. He, he, he didn't know about neural networks. I was the person who brought in the attention of neural networks, but that's another story. Yes. But he told me that fuzzy logic is nice because we can capture understanding of the systems without having a very precise mathematical formulation, but we have understanding. And then we started studying some papers that time. We didn't have much, but started studying some papers. He always talked about uh, Luis Eduardo because he read the paper about Luis Eduardo, but Luis Eduardo did not even know that he was doing something different. It was his PhD in, in Montreal, and then he went back to Brazil. And in Brazil, we had another person from Itajubá, Germano, who was also working with expert systems. So it was an incipient uh, group of people doing incipient research, not very strong. People didn't pay attention. It was, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there. But Professor Bose was my central motivator as my PhD advisor. And as the one who believes that, uh, yes, we should do something on that area. So that was in 1991. That's great. There is another professor, before we continue, or you stop a little bit, but there was another person who I would like to mention. When I arrived at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, there was Gilberto Souza, who is a Brazilian. And he was there in his second year, I believe, as a, of his PhD. So he finished a little before me because I arrived like uh, he was a red two years ahead of me. So in his case, he was also studying for the logic. Okay, so I remember that I discussed with uh, Gilberto, who was a professor in Espírito Santo, uh, Federal, uh, Espírito Santo, Federal, Espírito Santo, yes, UFIS. Uh, and uh, we had this group. There was another person, his name is Sunil Chaya, he was doing expert systems. So you see, I'm talking fuzzy logic, expert systems, not neural networks yet. I, I can save the discussion about neural networks. So that was my introduction on the area. And it was not really planned by me. It, uh, things start to happen and I start to see that this is a, a, a nice way for me to learn something new and to do something different. That's right. That's right. And so you moved to the United States in 1991, already aware that you would take a PhD in Proelectronics, but with artificial intelligence applications. I was not sure about the artificial intelligence. I knew that Professor Bose really was motivated with fuzzy logic. So when you moved when you moved to the United States, you would not you were not aware that you would you study artificial intelligence in your I, PhD. I didn't have plans for that. There was no course in fuzzy logic. That, that's, I myself. Yeah, that would be my my second question because one of the first tasks of a PhD student is to study the state of art. So if you came to United, if you go, you went to United States, uh, the initial years of your PhD probably you studied a lot of 
uh, uh, papers with artificial intelligence, but we could not see a lot, right? Because no. at that time it was it was quite... logic I learned by myself. But uh, what were the references for that? There are some papers like uh, published in in IEEE Translator, but very few. They were at that very, time, right? Yeah, but they were very, I would say, very elementary. I would say sometimes giving some basic ideas. There are some some publications by Professor Zadeh, who was the father of fuzzy logic. And uh, when I arrived in the United States in 1991. My main interest was this Professor Bose was and he still is because he's alive as of today, was very famous in Powertron. So my thing was to learn Powertronics. Fuzzy logic and artificial intelligence was a second or third priority. It appeared later to you that no, I came in parallel yes. because I had very many courses with Professor Bose and other professors there. I took Powertronics one, Powertronics two seminars. I took control course on all these things that we do as a piece from uh, applied math, linear algebra, you know. But there was one particular course that started to happen in 1992. It was in the nuclear engineering department of the University of Tennessee. In the nuclear engineering department of the University of Tennessee, there was a professor. I remember his first name. I don't remember his last name because I need to look up. His name is uh, Upadaya. Okay, so Professor Padaya was teaching an uh, introduction to AI and neural networks. So then I thought, wow, this course is about neural networks. So I talked to him and he said, yes, my main motivation of the course will be about neural networks. But we briefly touched fuzzy logic but because there is another course on fuzzy logic that we are not teaching this semester. Okay. So I went to the nuclear engineering department to take uh, the class in uh, statistical modeling and artificial intelligence and advanced control. It was in the nuclear engineering department, not in the electrical engineering department, because the University of Tennessee was at that time very strong, maybe still is, in the nuclear engineering. Who taught artificial intelligence at that time? Do you remember? There was a professor called Professor Urich, U-H-R-I-G, and Professor Padaya. Those are the ones in the nuclear engineering part. So there, do you remember the content of this course? Yeah, I remember. Sure, of course. It was like having a model, like a nuclear power plant, <laughs> because their thing was nuclear power. Okay? okay. So try to kind of visualize what's a nuclear power plant and how we can model this, model that, that, that. It was all math. I'm not in favor of nuclear engineering anyway, but yes, dynamic systems, behaviors of dynamic it systems. It was behavior dynamic okay. systems. Yeah, in particular, Professor Padaya, he was more stochastic modeling, so he really liked this time series approach and stuff like that. Professor Uric was really more uh, neural networks, and it was the first time I had a software that I could work with neural networks. The name of the, name of the software was NeuroWare, and it was very good to, uh, to run on DOS, and we could put, uh, put on the system uh, big data and run several topologies of neural networks. And he gave papers, he gave uh, chapters of books. So I had a formal uh, course in neural networks. But fuzzy logic, I learned by myself. I studied by myself. I discussed with Professor Boz, with Gilberto. I studied my, my books. I found a book by the Japanese uh, Terano. Uh, I forgot the names now, but there are some books by Japanese. And uh, fuzzy logic, I did myself and I did my own programming. I did everything C language or Seminole. Neural networks, we use this NeuroWare software. We could uh, write C code to compile it together. And everything at that time was uh, writing code. Okay, So even when I had to work with uh, digital signal processing, DSPs, uh, Texas Instruments C30, they were very nice, the C30 for that time. Okay. But uh, even the uh, Studio Composer, I think it's the software for Texas Instruments. It's the Code same. Composer Studio. Code Composer Studio, yes. They're just starting. Oh, at that time, they didn't have that. They just have the compiler. They have the, the linker. So we had to write things in assembly. We have to compile. We have to link together. And then we have a code that you plug a serial, a serial cable and then you upload to your DSP. It was very, I would say, hardware intensive, not really graphical user interface. So I was doing my fuzzy logic on my own. 
But when you say by your, your own, okay, you develop it, uh, an algorithm, everything, the rules, but what, what are the references? Just this Japanese professor you have or to look how, how many books you have did you have? to my thesis. I didn't prepare today. But do you remember um, and if you had a lot of books to study, just no. one book, nobody no. was studying that because in no. 1991, I suppose this we topic not. was quite new, right? And you could not find good references for it. Yes, nowadays. But it was not new, okay? You see that in my timeline. That you want to talk about that? No, no but uh, later. Maybe, but I'll just talk about the timeline here, okay? In my timeline here, because I made a timeline, okay? Shall you share here? Yes, yeah, can share. I will share the same picture. Yeah, you can share the timeline. So the timeline here, I try to show three timelines. Yeah, in that's the wine page, the first the one, right? First one. Yes. Yeah. Okay. 1850. Yeah, you can see on the left, if you zoom, if you zoom towards the left, I have here a piece of paper and Tiago is showing in the computer. Okay. It's fine, I'll talk. On the left, you have a timeline of uh, AI. On the right, you have a timeline of electrical engineering. And in the middle is not a timeline, but we have things that are relevant to computer technology. Okay. So you see here on the left, you can keep there. 1854, George Boole published an investigation of the laws of thought on which are founded mathematical theory of logic and probabilities. That is the beginning of the Boolean logic. Okay. But when he proposed that, he he thought he was proposing a way to model how our brain works. Okay. So that was 1854, and the first computers, they were made like 90 years after that. So the first computers, they were made around the Second World War. Yeah, just a moment, Professor. Uh, let me try to understand this timetable because I really think it is really interesting, but maybe the audience are not familiar with that. You made here a timeline for artificial intelligence. On the left. On the left here, right? Yeah. So you have some... Uh, dates here like this 1854 yeah, that's the, in the beginning in the right you have the same age but with some the electrical historical system, electrical systems electrical systems so you can see here in the left that something happened and you can locate this it's more or less if you go horizontally it's about the same time okay same period. that's their contemporaneous okay so you said here that George Bull first published this paper right no, no, which is a book, a book. Yeah. okay at the same time, you can see here what is was yeah, happening. Yeah, because it's 1887, yes. so it's, it's a little off, okay? Because that yes, was 1854. Yes, not really aligned. Over here, no, right? not really. Okay, that's good. But this so, yeah, is right. just to visualize. This is a visualization, okay? Okay. In the middle, you see here that Charles Babbage start to have uh, the first computer. It was an electromechanical computer, and then Ada Lovelace, who was the daughter of Lord Byron. She's considered to be the first programmer of the history because she made uh, an algorithm to be uh, used by Babbage in his machine for this uh, mechanical computer. Okay, and you see that at the same time we start to have uh, electrical systems, electrical technology. You can see here the C distribution by Thomas Edison in 1882, AC transmission at higher voltage by Westinghouse in 1886. Okay. And Nikola Tesla, he invented the induction machines in 1887. So you see that the end of uh, uh, 1800s, starting of uh, in, uh, the 20th century, because the 20th century starting uh, 1901, okay? Uh, you can see a lot of things that happened. For example, in, in 1902, we had the invention of the mercury arc, uh, arc rectifier. It was the beginning, the, the beginning of vacuum tubes and power electronics. Okay. okay, but you are saying that here, if you go back to the left side, the first one who start talking about something related to artificial intelligence. No, he didn't the, talk about artificial intelligence. He, he but why this is in the left side here? Because the timeline. This, because this is relevant to Boolean logic. Okay, but and fuzzy the, logic is not Boolean. Okay, but. But I'm not getting your point. We are going up in the years, up to nowadays, on the left side here. Yeah, okay. both. Everyone can go anywhere. Okay, let's go. Okay. So what I'm saying is that 1854, we had a book that started the Boolean logic. The Boolean logic, you accept true versus false. Okay? And Boolean logic is how we learn to program yes. computers. 
Yeah. Actually, it was based on our decisions, based on our circumstances, right? If you have a true and true, we may take a decision, the true, something like that. Yeah. Because George Bull also studied the human behavior of deciding how we decide. His book is more about how we can model the decision yeah. making in our based thoughts. on circumstances, in our thoughts. Yeah. How you think? Yeah, that's okay. Cool. So uh, a century later, we had computers that were based on the Boolean logic. Okay. okay. And the beginning of artificial intelligence as uh, neural networks was in 1943. Okay. That's yeah. Okay. In 1943 is the next event oh, here. You see and Pete's neural. Okay. okay. So in 1943, we start to have someone called McCulloch and another person called Pete's, but I don't know the where they are from. The United States. United States. Yeah. So they they define that if you have uh, a neuron and you have inputs, those inputs they use sum, they multiply by weight, and then you can calculate the weights to give you a certain decision making, one neuron only. So the first time that one neuron was proposed was in 1940, but that was a mathematical formulation. Artificial neuron, right? Yeah, it was mathematics. Yes, okay. okay. And then we start to have a lot of things happening in areas that were not yet correlated. For example, in 1949, we had something called habit learning. What's habit learning? Is when you learn something and you try to emphasize that behavior. Habian was uh, someone who taught on Pavlov and the way that uh, the Pavlov used to be the way to, to quote unquote, teach animals. That means if you, if you have a horse, you can have a stick or a carrot. So a carrot is a motivation. A stick is, is a way to, to make the horse to see that something's wrong. So if you have a way to punish or a way to reinforce something, you have a learning that's called having learning. So people try to apply having learning initially for these initial neurons. Okay. And in 19 is still is still used nowadays? Happy and learning. No, this is historical, but Just when historical. we study neural networks, you have you to mean... understand the basics. Okay. Okay. So those are basics. So in 1958 was the first time that a neuron was used in a way that could be trained. So that's called the Rosenblatt's perception. So what's a perception? Is a neuron. And that neuron could be connected with other neurons. And then you may have an algorithm that will define how that system will converge when you have input and output relationships. So you see here, that's 1958. So what was happening in our other areas? In 1945, which is uh, pretty much contemporaneous to artificial intelligence, John von Neumann published a report in the middle that uh, uh, pretty much define how a computer should be, okay? In terms uh, of what? In terms of mathematical. Mathematical. Yeah, John von Neumann is a mathematician, very okay. important mathematician, okay? okay? So John von Neumann, he, he thought on the computer in a mathematical way, and Ali, Alan Turing is from the same time, okay? But Alan Turing is not discussed here. John von Neumann was in the United States. And John von Neumann, he published his uh, first draft report on the ADVAC. So it was, how to say, a mathematical formulation in how a computer should be built. Okay? We didn't have digital computers at that time yet. Okay? We had maybe relays, we had some sequential ways to do stuff, but not the modern computer. The modern computer, which we call the John von Neumann architecture, has a bus where you have uh, a flow of uh, uh, information that you have a sequence, and then you go to the memory, you extract what you have in the memory, you bring to the accumulator, you do a sum or a, or a subtraction, and you do something, you return to the accumulator. Very close to assembly. It was assembly. Assembly, or assembly was based on yeah. this. This is assembly in nature, so. Yeah, assembly, what you call assembly, is like an implementation of his mathematical idea. His idea was math. Okay, mm -hmm. assembly is how we implement that. Okay, but if you if you if you do assembly programming, pretty much you are following the ideas of John von Neumann in what we call John von Neumann architecture. Okay? That's great. 
So in 1945, we start the beginning of the computer technology. In 1943, we start the beginning of neural networks. And in 1948, you see here on the, on the right, we had the invention of transistors, okay? So we didn't have transistors yet. We just had vacuum tubes. So transistors, they came to be in 1948. And the first transistors was uh, what's called a point contact transistor. It's a transistor that you could see something connect uh, in, in, in the body of the, the germanium or selenium. And it was not the same uh, transistor that we use today because it was this contact, okay? But it was invented by then and Shockley was the person who invented what we call the junction transistor. So what really made possible the modern transistor uh, was not the initial invention of the transistor that was the uh, uh, point of contact, but the junction transistor. The junction transistor is what we understand today. NPN has two junctions, and then you have a, a doping to make the uh, silicon to have more electrons or less electrons to have P and N, and then you have a barrier. That, that's what we learn when we have the fa first physics of semiconductors. Yes. And that's the idea of transi transistors. And you see that PV started in 1955. Uh, Photovoltaics, right? Yeah. And this is very important. In 1956, General Electric invented that was something that was a connection of two transistors. And one transistor would feed back another one would lock the system. That was what we call SCR, silicon control rectifier. So the birth of power electronics is in 1956, because as soon as we invented SCRs, Okay. Power electronics became possible because the transistors that we had before the SCRs, they are not really made for high voltage or current. They are just made for a signal. Okay. Yes. So what I'm trying to emphasize here is that 1940s and 1950s was the beginning of these three areas that are correlated. One is uh, knowledge, artificial intelligence. Okay. You can see here on the left, there is a name I put here. Yeah. From 1940s to 1970s, we call the uh, age of cybernetics, okay? The age of cybernetics because we were using what people used to call cybernetics, okay? Cybernetics was trying to make an uh, 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 electronic brain, a brain that was emulating the human brain. That's the idea. So the cybernetic was pretty much based on binary values, uh, Boolean logic, then uh, the neurons, they would have thresholds, so the neurons would have something that, that at the end of the neuron would have a zero, one, or a plus one, or minus one to give you a decision. And by that time, uh, all the neural networks, they were a single layer, maybe two layers on, okay? And we had the beginning of the computers, and we had the beginning of the uh, electronic revolution with the invention of the transistors and what is important in our area, the SCRs, which gave birth to what we call today uh, power electronics. So on the right, you see here that I call from 1882 to 1958, the area of electrotechnology. Okay? It was uh, not electrical engineer per se, not electronic per se, but it was a combination and a merging of physics electrical engineering and electronics engineering in a way that people would receive an education that was more physics oriented and but kind of uh, approaching what we call today electrical engineering education that's the area of the electrotechnology and the area of cybernetics so that's the first uh, map that we have here that's uh, uh, i would say uh, uh, section of my timeline. My timeline goes from 1855 until 2020. Someday I'm going to expand this timeline, put more events. But when I discuss, I, I talk about that. You can see on my back here, see this, uh, can maybe show. This is a, is a frame I made here. This is exactly the frame of the yes. timeline. So I have what, what we are discussing here is the top. Okay, let's go to the top. Then we have another slide for the 
video yes. and another slide for this one. Here. What Professor Marcelo is showing is this first picture here, which is very difficult to see. In the difficult computer. to see. There is a great timeline. So Professor, Mar Professor Marcelo divided it into four parts. We were discussing the first part, but what Professor Marcelo is showing in the wall is this full figure of the whole timeline, right? Yeah, because I, I printed. This has about uh, eight centimeters by 40 centimeters, and it fits that frame, okay? But it's, it's still here, it's difficult to, to see because we have to be very close because the letters are very small because it's too much information to, to check. Maybe one day I'll clean. Yes. This is I available will... in your last book about artificial intelligence, right? From I don't know if the whole timeline, but a yes. part of the timeline is there. You are always updating this, right? Is there any web page that you make this available to the No, I have a personal web page, but that personal web page, I'm not committed to update. Because it. for sure, you are going to update this very often, right? Because one day I have new update. finding is new revolutionary this finding is so you're going to update this it would be nice if we can reach this publicly uh, anywhere in, in our web page this would be nice okay so just to conclude this first picture here so so i didn't i didn't reach fuzzy logic yes <laughs> okay this maybe we're gonna we're gonna talk in the next segment maybe yes. we're gonna have a, a but a pause here and we'll come back here we'll talk about the beginning of fuzzy logic the problems with neural networks on that time, and then we go towards 1990s, where I really started to study. Because when I when I went to University of Tennessee, I have to study historical books, technological books, and uh, papers. So I have to learn by myself. You know, fuzzy logic I taught myself. Nobody taught me. I taught by myself. And the only course I had in the nuclear engineering department was about neural networks, which was really exciting and new for me. And when I talked to Professor Bose, I said, hey, Professor Bose, I'm learning neural networks. And I just did this. I showed him that I, 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 I use uh, data from a vector control a motor drive in my neural network. He was amazed. He said, this is amazing. So let's write a paper. When we wrote a paper about, fuzzy uh, about neural networks, I already had written papers in fuzzy logic. My first paper in fuzzy logic was published in a conference in IEEE IAS, Industry Application Society, in 1993, I guess, or 1992, I have to look. It was using fuzzy logic for uh, defining uh, power quality of distorted waveforms. Okay? But that was published only in a conference. We tried to send to the transaction, but that time nobody took seriously fuzzy logic and neither neural networks. So it was rejected and I move on, okay, but I published. And it's there available on IEEE Explore if you want, okay. But that was my first paper. That's good. So let's make a pause. Yeah, we'll come back. Okay, let's continue our talk with Professor Marcelo. Professor Marcelo was talking about the timeline of some findings and discovery of artificial intelligence and creation invention, right? So let's continue from the timeline. I will share again the screen. Yeah, the second this, timeline, the yeah. second part of the timeline. Okay, now we are here. Please, Professor. Yeah, you can see here, uh, this goes from 1958 on the left, and now so 1950. Eight on the right, okay, and goes until 1996 on the left. So I'm here because 1996 I was right back to Brazil. I was in Tennessee from 1991 to 1995. Okay, so let's see what this is about. Okay, okay. so on the left, as we are discussing, is a timeline more relevant to artificial intelligence. On the right is a timeline relevant to electrical power, power electronics, electrical systems. And in the middle, some events, not really a timeline, relate to computers, just to position ourselves as what was happening, some computer, uh, how to say, uh, activities that time. Okay? So in 1958, we had the Rosenblatt's perceptron. It was the beginning of neural networks. 
and uh, neural networks start to become uh, important in the 60s, during the 60s. So I was a, I was a child because I was born in 1963. Okay. In 1965, you can see on the left that Professor Lotfi Zadeh, he published Fuzzy Sets. It was a paper where he proposed the idea that we can discuss about variables in a way that you can define that those variables they have a certain degree of certainty they start to incorporate the idea that uncertainty is part of how we define things in our real world for example if i look outside through my window now i'm gonna say that Today is a little bit cloudy and kind of rainy. So this is a regular way that we speak in our daily life. We define things in, in an uncertain way. And I would say that Tiago understood what I said. Tiago understand, understand what is a little bit cloudy, kind of uh, rainy, a little wet, maybe stuffy day. Everything is kind of very imprecise. But it's the way that humans communicate. Okay. If you ask somebody how to have uh, a recipe for a cake, the person is going to say to take the flour, to put the eggs, to beat with a whiskey or with a machine, and to maybe to try the texture of the doll. But all the descriptions will not be mathematically precise, will be uncertain. So uncertainty is part of the human behavior. The way that we communicate, it's full of uncertainty, and you are okay with that. A computer is not okay with that. How a computer can understand it's a little bit cloudy and rainy? How a computer can understand that the dough is kind of uh, hard or kind of uh, uh, soggy? You know, it's uh, when you start using adjectives and start using descriptions, uh, we add layers of uh, imprecision. But that's the way that we define things in our real life. So Professor Zadeh, he was already a very strong, he's a polymath. He knew physics and math. He was behind of uh, the Z transform. Do you think the Z transform, the Z comes from where? It's from him. Zadeh, nobody knows because he was involved with the people who defined the, the transformation in the Z transform, the Z domain. Okay. So Professor Zadeh was a friend of uh, Kalman. So in the same area, in the same school, we had the guy who made Kalman filter, which is very mathematically oriented. And Professor Zadeh, who was a strong uh, control systems person, but he decided that knowledge should be understood in a more imprecise way. So that's why he proposed this idea of fuzzy sets. Okay? So if I have a variable, let's say, um uh, uh i'm gonna say that as something is hot or something is cold so what hot means well it depends depends on the situation okay hot could be for example i cannot hold it so if i cannot hold a pan because it's on the oven it's hot but uh, the temperature of the pan in the oven could burn your hands of course but it's not as hot as hot is a car engine. A car engine is, uh, the temperature is way higher. It's not hot like uh, a nuclear reaction in, in a nuclear power plant, okay? So being hot or being cold depends on where that description is applicable. So if we start defining that something's cold or hot and then we have to take decisions and then we have to associate a logic that's not precise. That's called fuzzy logic. So fuzzy logic is a way that we adapt the Boolean logic in a way that we can take the degrees of uncertainty in the descriptions and we have to come up with some, how to say, conclusion. And that conclusion may have also a degree of uh, possibility. Okay, So all of this, all this uncertainty is part of fuzzy logic. And the beauty of fuzzy logic is that we can write a mathematical program with lines of codes, okay? 
we, in any computer language. It doesn't need to be any stratospheric, something simple. You know, computer language could be, I use C, but you can use whatever you want. You can use basic, you can use Pascal, you can use uh, Julia, Python, whatever, it doesn't matter, okay? But there is a way that you write a code where you can make uh, associations of variables that you have a certain degree of uncertainty and that degree of uncertainty will be combined. For example, if this temperature is very high and that pressure is very low, then the valve on this uh, regulator should be medium, okay? So our, this description may make sense for somebody who is, for example, controlling a machine or maybe controlling a process. And then you can interview a person. You can write what you interview in that person. And with that interview, you make up the rules and how you understood that process. And you write code in your computer that you follow the way that you heard that interview. There is no mathematical composition of that, but there is a way to implement that in a computer. So that's the beauty of fuzzy logic, taking semantic knowledge, verbal knowledge, the human way of explaining things to make a computer implement, understand, and do the control and actuation of that. We, in my book, I'm gonna talk about this right now, in my book that I published two years ago, Artificial Intelligence for Smart Power System, published by IET. Okay, I have uh, chapters in fuzzy logic and chapters in neural networks. So if you study my book, you can be introduced at least. I cannot promise you that you'll be a researcher with my book, but you can grasp what you need to do to understand, to implement fuzzy logic and neural networks. Okay. So we can write code, and in that code, you can implement uh, a description that's not mathematical. So of course, if you are a mathematician, if you are a control systems person, you're gonna say, okay, prove me that the system is stable. Uh, that's a discussion we can leave for another time, okay? But sometimes it's very difficult to prove that what you wrote is stable, but, uh, you can do by exhaustive simulations, you can do by ad hoc demonstration, but uh, really going into the hyper stability discussions of control systems is not really a good way to tackle fuzzy logic problems. Neural networks are even more complicated because neural network is really a black box, okay? A neural network is an algorithm that associates an input with an output most of the time. Then we have uh, a way to train the neural network to do that. Or we may have a neural network that we do not have input and output, but you only have data that you have to clusterize. So if you have data and you have to find clusters and you have to define patterns, but you don't have an IO, an input and output, you can still have neural networks to do that. And you can still have training algorithms to do that. Okay, but still sometimes it's difficult to prove there is some kind of stability. Okay, so if you if uh, it, just let me can I make a comment? Sure, go ahead. Yes, stability is quite difficult to prove. Very often we are asked about proving stability, which need to prove based on a methodology. You are saying that it's not easy to prove stability in fuzzy control strategies, at least you can, for instance, usually find a region of stability, for instance, from this point to this point, based on these inputs, based on these decisions, I can ensure that the system is stable. Is there something right like that? Well, the way that I implement fuzzy logic is using uh, programming. So everything in a fuzzy logic algorithm is a combination of uh, multiplications, divisions, subtractions, it's uh, linear equations with some decision making, you know, there is a math behind that, okay? And that math represents the way that the fuzzy works, uh, fuzzy logic works. So if you can take that math and incorporate in your analysis and you can prove that's stable or not, that's possible, okay? It, it sounds to me that the fuzzy logic is naturally stable because you have a red, you have defined inputs, right? You have, well, the system is uh, quite hot, not so hot. 
you always have a limited range of inputs and you know what decisions to take based on these inputs, right? Is that naturally stable? Is there a situation that your input would produce an unstable output? I cannot, I cannot understand that. I really cannot say if we can say that's naturally stable, but I'm going to say something that's in my book about fuzzy logic. So I show or discuss. Uh, What's the chapter? In fuzzy logic. So I'm looking here. Just a minute. The fuzzy sets. And maybe next chapter. Personally, I don't have this book in PDF here to show to the audience. Yeah. I have just chapter eight and, and nine. Okay. Figure 5.1 and figure 5.2. Okay. I don't know if they can see, but. But I'll describe. No okay. Problem. It's a figure 5.1, you have a control systems. Okay. So in the control systems, you have a closed loop control and then you have a, an identifying for your plant. plant. Okay. Okay. So you usually do a system identification, you get to the Laplace transform. Okay. So that's the typical way that we do uh, control systems. We identify, we either have the transfer function of the plant, or I have to run some system identification to find the equations that define my plant. See. And then when I have the map for my plant, I will define my controller. Okay. This so, is quite normal for linear controllers. Yeah, that's the way that most of okay. people do any control. You should system. define the plant obtain the model, and with this model, you can design Find linear control. controllers, yeah. non-linear controllers, that's good. Yeah, a fuzzy logic control is here. Okay. Let me try to show so, them. So, Tiago is showing here, I will describe. So, a fuzzy logic control is also a closed loop control. However, most of the time, we have a human operator controlling the plant. Okay, for example, you go to a factory that makes uh, wine or makes beer, or you go to a concrete, uh, concrete, I'm saying cement concrete, and you talk to those people, they are they are controlling the machines, they are controlling the, the, the flow of whatever is coming and going. So we have a human operator. So we now do an identification of the human operator. The identification of the human operator. How it, human it behaves, control. right? So you do not design a controller based on your math. You design a controller based on the operator. So that's the idea of fuzzy logic. Fuzzy logic tries to replace the operator by inserting a system that we write and we replace the operator without really doing a system identification of the plant to do the control system design. So that's the way that we design fuzzy logic control. And this can be implemented in many things. For example, uh, I have a book in Portuguese. It was published in 1997 or 1998, maybe 1998, by the Edgar Buscher. It's the uh, editor in Brazil. It's still published. It's on the second edition, and it sells. It still sells. A lot of people. Is this one? Is the first one on the yeah. list? Yes. Okay. Professor Marcelo is talking about this book no, here. No. This one here. This one. Which is yeah. red book. Yeah. So this is written in Portuguese only, right? Only Portuguese, yeah. Okay. So this book is only for people who speak or read Portuguese. In uh, a lot of people in Brazil and in Portugal, they, they use this book because it was the first book in, in Portuguese language. So even though by that time we had many books in Portuguese, in fuzzy logic, the first book for the Portuguese language was my book published in 1998. Maybe there are others today, okay? I think there are. But uh, that was important for people who want to understand the fuzzy logic. And uh, in there, you see uh, all the ways to implement the, uh, the logic, the decision, the fuzzification, the defuzzification, everything. Okay, so uh, let's try to deviate a little bit to neural networks. Otherwise, we'll just be talking about fuzzy logic one. Okay, what is the distinction in using fuzzy logic versus neural networks? Fuzzy logic is a nice tool. I'm not saying that's the only tool, but it's a nice tool when you have a, a semantic description to what you want to do. Okay, for example, you want to implement. Uh, and this happened, okay? 
There was a PhD student in ITA. ITA is the school in, in Brazil, okay? Uh, and that person... In the Aer Aeronautical Institute. Institute of Technology. Yes. And that person, now she retired. So she's younger than me, but she just, she just retired. She, she, she did her PhD in the modeling and control of scheduling of aircrafts, okay? And she was considering many things to do the planning for the aircraft scheduling. And she used my book, okay? And she was very grateful to me after my book. She said it was very, very important for her. I had, uh, I always received somebody saying, I use your book for financial decisions. I use your book for uh, law school. I use your book for it's interesting. Uh, business. It's not only engineering. So fuzzy logic has a potential that's way beyond of only engineering, okay? Neural networks also, okay? But fuzzy logic is important when you have human way of describing things and you want to capture that operator's uh, behavior. behavior and replace the operator's behavior with something that's implemented in the computer, okay? A neural network can do that, uh, but first, there are many types of neural networks. I have in my book here three chapters on neural networks, okay? But I would say that we could we could try to contextualize that in neural networks. We have the ones that are feed forward. That means the system propagates from input to output, feed forward neural network. We still have to, to train, okay? But the signal will flow one way. So it's like a map. If you have a matrix, a matrix is a mapping. You have a certain you have a certain vector that you multiply by the matrix and you have another vector. So a, a matrix multiplication by a vector is a, a initial way to make a mapping, okay? So a feed forward neural network is a mapping, but it's a nonlinear mapping because we have all the operations that we have inside the neurons, okay? So, and then we have the, the neural networks that could uh, uh, oscillate, in, in their behavior and could compete with other neurons. And in that uh, competition, we may have a winning neuron that will give a certain output, okay? So I describe here in, in my book, one chapter, that's uh, the feed forward one. Uh, it's uh, here, chapter six, feed forward neural networks. We talk here about the Macaulot pitts neuron, example of back propagation. And then I talk about the other one that's called feedback competitive and associative neural network. So that's very important because this chapter seven here in my book, feedback competitive and associative neural networks are data that they do not have input and output patterns. They only have data that you have to find the relationships or you have to find clusterization or you have to make decisions. For example, you go to your street fair and then you're gonna buy orange, okay? So you see those orange here, those orange there, and you touch the orange, you see that one looks ripe, the other one looks weird, you don't want that, you don't like the, the color, you don't like the smell. You make a decision, there is no input and output. And your network may look to data and decide that this orange is better than that, okay? Or may decide that this, uh, particular decision in a financial situation is better than another one without having input and output. So a neural network has this capability of finding patterns that mathematical formulation, physics-based formulation, they cannot allow you to find, okay? And we have many types of training, many types of algorithms to do that. So coming back to this, kind of discussion of the timeline because we are based in this, because this reflects a little bit my career as well, okay? If you if you go to the left, you see that 1940 to 1970s, I call cybernetics, okay? And then there's a gap, see, there's a gap, just, there's a gap, yeah, that gap is intentional. It's because neural networks died. <laughs> what do you mean by died? They died. In 1970? In 1969. 1969? Yeah, because Minsk and Parper... What, what that means, that died? 
Nobody still when somebody, when some, everybody gave up. When some since that you bury. Everybody gave up studying that. They gave up or they or they changed they changed the terminology. Because but we didn't have funds for it. I'm gonna explain. Okay, go ahead. In 1969, Minsk and Parpert they wrote that it's impossible to train a neural network with three layers. Okay, so they show the limitation of the perceptual training. They show that the perception, perceptrons, which is a combination of neurons, they could be training two layers. You have an input and an output layer. But when you have a third layer, you could not go inside of the weights that connect the middle layer to the output to train. Because uh, uh, you could not find a way to blame a weight for a, a certain error in the output. Okay, so uh, just a question. Uh, did someone try to prove the contrary? Not the time, because uh, they were very famous, you know. Actually, he's dead and everybody okay. He's and Minsky was, Minsky is a very important person, you know, even though he was responsible for the death of the neural network in 1969. So when he said that there is such a kind of limitation, everybody accepted very well, respecting him. No, no one tried no, no. to prove the contrary. Yeah, they tried, to prove, actually impossible they tried to, prove. to prove the contra, but not in the United States. Okay. For example, that yeah. continued in Japan and other places in Europe. Okay. But in the United States, the government, DARPA, was very involved in funding this because DARPA is military. Military likes to fund things that they believe will work. Okay. So they they dry their funds. They stopped funding anything. National Science Foundation, whatever, everyone started, stopped that. So after the publication of this book, the field of neural network died. Okay. okay, so what happens is that a few people continue to study, but they called something else. For example, in 1975, Albus, James Albus, he published CIMAC. CIMAC is, that? CIMAC is Cerebral Modeling Articulation Control. It was uh, an algorithm that uh, is based on the spinal system and how the spinal system responds to our limbs and our in in our how to say biology of this and he was trying to use that for robots okay so he focused on robotic manipulators and he focused on this kind of uh, algebraic way to do that but he didn't call a neural network okay and he didn't use any particular algorithm it was maybe heavy on learning and uh, Stefan Grossberg, he started to study the visual system and he was one of the first to propose what's called self-organizing competitive neural network, which is uh, one of the uh, paradigms that I was just talking about before my chapter seven. Okay? Stefan Grossberg, he believed that the eyes and the optical nerve would have a way to give you mathematics to do this kind of decision, okay? And then in 1982, in this very country here in Finland, we had the self-organizing maps and associative memory. It was kind of a reborn of artificial intelligence because no, have here no. a new area. Is not, what is this yeah. rectangle here? This I, still I, died. I, 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 I will discuss, I didn't reach that. Okay. okay. 1982 was dead. So when I was a student at the University of São Paulo from 1981 to 1985, it's considered the death, the first death. Neural networks had two deaths. That was the first. Okay, then we're gonna have the third. So the the the, the this death was until 1985. Okay, in 1982 here in Finland we had a professor called Tihuvo Kahona. Okay. I believe from University of uh, Helsinki. I don't know. We have, we have to look where he was uh, working that time. But he has a book that I read that book many times. Okay? It, maybe now is on the third edition, but I read the first book. Not in 1982. I read for his book in the 90s. Okay? And he proposed a way to do um, a neural network that does not need input and output. And people used to call Kahonan network. Maybe because he was very humble, because he in Finland people do not like to self-promote themselves. He didn't want to use his last name. So he emphasized that he was not Kahonan Neural Network, which was his last name. 
and he wrote that the, the neural network that he invented was self-organizing maps, SOM. Okay, so in 1982 we had this self-organizing map. In 1975, CMAC. In 1976, Grossberg. But people start to 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 forget this idea that we have an electronic brain. The idea of cybernetics was behind. Okay, people was interested to really understand. Maybe we have some biological ways to define neural networks or maybe some natural ways that could help me to define an algorithm to train the neural network. That's called connectionism, okay? So connectionism started in 1980s and it went through until 2005, you can see here, okay? So connectionism is what gave rise to what we call cognitive science, okay? When I was a professor at the University of Sao Paulo from 1990, six to 2000, because I worked in Brazil after my PhD, I used to go to some seminars of uh, uh, ciência cognitiva, cognitive science. And then we have medical doctors, psychologists, a lot of people who are not from my area. Okay? All together, the same. Yeah, and we're discussing ideas and thoughts. It was very nice, those all those discussions. And there was a medical doctor who he was a medical, okay? So he worked in a hospital. But he was also doing a PhD in computer science at the Polytechnic, okay? So he was a student there. He was very intelligent. So I learned, even in USP in that time, that people from other areas, they believe that we may have ways to behave, to, to see the behavior of people or the behavior of birds, or maybe how fish flock, or, or maybe how the wind does something, or how the brain, or how the cortex, or stuff like that that's in our own biology, could uh, allow you to have a neural network, okay? So that's called connection. And the rebirth of the neural network was about 1985, because we had the invention of back propagation. Backpropagation is an algorithm that you use to take the output data, then you calculate the error, go, you go inside on the first weights, and you calculate the, the, uh, the derivative of the weight in respect to the error and the output, and you have a term to change the weight. You, you take the error and the output, you calculate the derivative of the weight in respect to that, and then you change the weight when you go inside. This is used a lot in engineering, like adaptive filters, yeah. system identification. Yes. You can but always adapt common filter itself that's right. has this kind of ability to uh, adjust the gain. Yes. And this was uh, made by people in control systems in the 40s. So it was not something new. It was something that was adapted for neural networks because when you go to the next layer, because suppose you have three layers, you have input, the hidden layer, middle layer, and the output. When you go from the output, you can take this uh, way to change the weights and go into the first weights that connect the output of the middle layer. But when you go to the next one, how much you are going to change each weight in respect to a near and the output? How can I blame that? So there is a way that you calculate a total amount of error in the hidden layer that was proposed by many people, okay? So it was invented by, by three groups, okay? In the United States, uh, there was a group in the United States that they had a series of books, and there was a guy who I like to associate him as the main fighter, because it depends on your preference, okay? By main but, one? the preference. Oh. So this guy who I believe was really the father, his name is Paul Verbos. W-E-R-B-O-S. Paul Verbos. Was, you can hear in your timeline or not? Maybe Paul Verbos is not there. He's only in my book, but I didn't put Paul Verbos here. Okay? Okay. Because Paul Verbos had a, a PhD in 1970s. Okay. And he presented back propagation, but he never thought that would be used for neural networks. Okay. 
Paul Verbos wrote a thesis uh, in how to model algebraic systems and how to do this algorithm that he didn't call back propagation. Or maybe he was the first one to call. I don't remember exactly if he was the first one or not. But he did that in 1970s. But he did not realize that he was contributing for the rebirth of neural networks. So your question, did die? Yeah, it died. But somebody in the 70s had a PhD thesis in psychology. And that was Paul Verbos, and he's an engineer, he's a mathematician, okay? And in 1985, we had a group of people who wrote a uh, uh, program for the PDP-11 in training, and there was a Japanese in Japan uh, called uh, Arimoto, I, or Marimoto, I think it's Arimoto, who also proposed backpropagation. So that time, we didn't have people going to conferences like we have today or going to the internet and discussing things. You know, everything was very difficult to communicate at that time. But we had three, at least three different places that around the same time discovered backpropagation. Okay. But in 1985, this group here wrote a book. And the book is in my, is in my, in my what book. group? By what people? In 1985. Uh, Humala... No, just to point here 1985. in the timeline. 1985. You have to go to the reference in my book here. Yeah, Hinton is one of the guys. This guy here. Hinton was in the game. The other one. Yeah, I need to find. I'm, I'm not prepared for that. Yes, not worry. Okay. But what I'm saying is this. We start to have the rebirth of neural networks because we found a way to program neural networks and make them learn with backpropagation. In 1985 was when I was finishing my, my bachelor's degree. Okay, So when I finished my bachelor's degree in 1985, it's theoretically the official rebirth of neural networks. So it was new everywhere in the world in 1985. Okay. And in 1991, six years later, I was at the University of Tennessee. So six years later, in six years, a lot of things happened, including the fact that I was at the University of Tennessee in 1991. And in 1992, I had a course <laughs> in neural networks. So it was like seven years after the rebirth of neural networks. And I remember that Professor Yurik at the University of Tennessee, he mentioned already about, you know, that uh, the neural networks, they, it was dead, nobody believed in neural networks, so people who continue to work with neural networks, they were using other terminology like uh, cerebellar modern articulator control or, or cortex-based uh, operation or self-organizing maps, because people knew, wow, oh, somebody killed the neural network, why am I going to want to Make make a resuscitation of this dead thing, you know. But it, it it came back, came back to life. Okay. And after neural network, you can see here in my in my neural network, all of these are papers. I'm not going to discuss one by one, but you can see here control C Mac. Yes, just summarize them and let's move. Yeah, but on. that's too much for me to talk. Yes, so okay, uh, don't worry. But you see here from 1986 to 1996, you have papers in identification, control, classification, because I wrote a paper that was uh, a discussion about neural networks. So we made a very comprehensive literature review. That's why I have these papers, okay? The paper, this paper that I wrote with my PhD student, his name is, was, because he passed away, Paulo Almeida from Cefet in Minas Gerais, and his wife at that time, Magali Meirelles. So my, Magali, Paulo, and me, we wrote a review paper that was published by IEEE in 2004, more or less, which is the industrial applicability of neural networks. So we had binders and binders of papers, and we discussed all of that and associate all that. So that's why I have a lot of details here, because we really did that, OK? So from 1985 to 1996 until uh, 2004, 2005, is the peak of this connectionism. We start to have uh, neural networks topologies and all sorts of trainings all sorts of things that uh, you can never imagine. For example, I had a student at the University of uh, Sao Paulo, Javier Ropero Pelais. 
he came from Spain and he was doing a master in medicine in in Spain and he did his PhD with me and he was very mathematician. I'm not a mathematician. I like math, but I'm not a mathematician. I like physics more than math. Okay, but he was really a mathematician and he liked this uh, thalamus and cortex. So this uh, uh, thalamus cortical Pelais and Simons here in 1999 was a publication with my PhD student. Okay, so we start to have all these sorts of uh, how behavior, how cognitive science, how con how connection is it can support you to write and do a new neural network. It was an explosion of neural networks. It was neural networks everywhere. And then you start to have conference, and then you start to have a triple E transactions, and then you start to have uh, in, in Brazil we have the uh, Sociedade Brasileira de Automação (SBA), SBA. And I organized the first uh, Seminário Brasileiro de Inteligência Artificial, something like that. It was in Sao Paulo. And there was a professor from INPI. Her first name is Sandra. He was, she was very famous that time in neural networks. And there was somebody from PUC in Brazil. So when I was in Brazil from 96 to 2000, I met everyone in Brazil who was doing this. And I was going to conference, so I was meeting people. You know, there was conference in neural networks. And then this started to become very common in discussions. Then in conference in 1997 or 1998, Professor Bose invited me to be a keynote speaker in a panel discussion of the ICON, if, I don't, if, I, if, if I'm not wrong. So I was there with some people who were older than me, but I was the youngest one talking about artificial intelligence. So Professor Bose always told me, and I have to believe this because that affects me, that I was a pioneer in really applying, really, fuzzy logic and neural networks in power electronics. We had some other people doing that, but I was one of the first ones, or someone who was brave enough to do it and continue to publish. Okay? What, what was the application? What was the converter, it was motor drives or active features. Well, I, I have to go to my citations, okay? So the papers that I have the most citations are the papers of my PhD. Okay? Now, now I have papers of citations that are more recent, okay? okay? But until 10 years ago, the papers that had more citations were my papers from my PhD in fuzzy logic for wind turbines and wind energy systems. I have two papers on that on fuzzy logic. I had uh, uh, papers on using neural networks for vector control signal processing. I had a paper on fuzzy logic for uh, peak power tracking system. But this changed a little bit because I continue, of course, my career. And now these papers from the beginning of my career, they have hundreds of citations, but now I have others that are kind of topping them, okay? Just a curiosity, because you had said that one of your papers that you published in a conference you had some difficult to be accepted in the transactions that time, but those that you are talking now, they how, how they were accepted, they were usually accepted, they were accepted. accepted. They but were. Do, you, do you remember the process? Because, oh, yeah, yeah, because this came to my mind that a statement that you said that it was difficult to publish. My first paper that I published. It's just a curiosity because I'd like my, to, uh, it's nice to hear that you were one of the pioneers in this field. So I'd like to hear how the editors and reviewers were receiving them, accepting, or they. it was a hard work, Yeah. a okay. long path or a short path. Okay, everything is a long path. Since have, the have, beginning, so we have to always play for the long term. But you think nowadays is more difficult? Nowadays is more nowadays more difficult because we have more competition. At okay, that time we didn't have much competition. So if you did something well and well done, and how but, say, but not only only competition because you have something. If you have something really new, it is quite natural that the editor and reviewers would who you see with. Uh, a strange eyes. Oh, ah, yeah. Neural networks for the logic was like that. Th that's that's I was curious about because you were on the first to submit these papers with this kind of novelties in power electronics. Since Professor Bose said to you that you were the pioneer, 
So how, how the editors and reviewers? I don't know how because they, what I can say is about my experience. I don't know about the editor's experience. Okay, what I know is this: in 1993, I guess that I think it's 93. I went to Toronto in Canada and I had a paper in the IES there, IEEE IES conference, conference, right? Conference. That paper is using fuzzy logic for uh, the for evaluation of distortion in waveforms of power electronics. That paper was rejected in the transaction, but that paper was accepted in the conference. So okay, that's still there. But that's after nice. that, I had my PG, and in my PG, I had to have a working system. I had to have a machine. I had to have two DSPs. I had to have hardware. I had to have oscilloscopes taking pictures of the waveforms. I have to have a system that operates in a way that's stable and uh, coordinated. So when you show that to the industry application society that you have experimental work, it's accepted. That's nice. Okay. So if you do something that you prove that you have done and you have hardware that shows it's accepted, you know, it's it's an industrial application society. You have to accept it. So it was accepted. So the when I was about to finish my PhD and I finished my PhD in 95, I start sending papers to the IEEE IS, to the IEEE Port of Toronto Society, and they were accepted at that time. And those papers in the beginning, we did not have many citations, but as the year passed, people found that my papers could be valuable. Okay. And I even, I even have some paper, some people who copy my papers, but this is another story, okay? So the, there are there are people who plagiarize my paper 15 years after the fact, and they claim to be novel, okay? Something that I published in '95, and then I had to start uh, plagiarism, how to say, evaluation in the IEEE against those people. So, but this is another story. But what I'm saying is this. I believe that uh, I published this in 1995, 1996, 1997. They were relevant to my PhD. But my life is not defined by my PhD. I did many other things after that. But eventually, uh, with the years passing, those initial papers, they become very relevant historically because I had a lots of citations on that. And when I became an IEEE fellow, the citation of my IEEE fellow is for contributions of artificial intelligence in power electronics. So when you become a fellow of IEEE, you for something that you have done in the past, not something that's for the future, something that you have done in the past, and it's kind of recognized that you made a, a contribution on that. So that was my IEEE fellow base you know, for uh, applications or contributions of artificial intelligence or power electronics. But coming back here, yes. see, you see here, I talk a little bit about computers, Texas instruments, introduced DSPs and Linux, which is also a Finnish thing, was released in 1991. Okay, So there are two Finnish connections here. One is uh, a neural network in 1982, that's self-organizing map by Tehuv Kahonan. And then Linux was a Finnish PhD student who who made it, and I was one of the first ones to install because I remember that in August 1991, I had a friend in Knoxville, Tennessee, and he came to me and said, Marcelo, I just downloaded this operating system. I said, what's that? Linux. I said, I have no idea what's that. Yeah, I'm going to install. And then he took his IBM PC, replaced the DOS, with Linux and it was working, it was on the internet, it was doing FTP and Telnet and everything. He was amazed. <clears throat> and I told him, yeah, it's nice, but you don't have anything there. Eh, but I can program and see that. So he was happy, you know. So, but I remember, I remember this time when Linux just came to the existence in 1991. And then in 1993, see, I put here myself, see, 1993, Marcelo seems to develop fuzzy logic neural networks application product for power quality induction motor vector controls and with turbine enhanced motor control. So this is my book, this is my timeline. So I put myself here in 1993. So this is around the timeline of the connection here and the timeline that power systems and power electronics are two areas. Okay. If you go back to if you go to the next timeline, which is the continuation, the, the bottom of my my friend, the one there, you see that connection is, uh, ends in 2005, more or less. Why? 
because there was a saturation. Everybody did everything. Everything you can ever imagine was done by 2005. So for some time, I had the impression there is nothing new to be done in neural networks. So I was not really excited in neural networks for some time. And then power system power electrons that were too few, they start to be merged. Why? Because we have the needs of smart grid, renewable energy, intelligent control. So I would say that 2006, 2007, because we start to have this idea that the grid should be better, should be more integrated, should be more intelligent. We have to have uh, a holistic way to design power electronics and power systems. So I put here that 2008 is the beginning of this merging of power electronics and power systems into a smart grid in a way that we should understand electrical engineer in a more holistic, in a more comprehensive way. You should not define yourself only as a power electronics person. You should not define yourself as a power system person. You should not define, define yourself as only a control systems person. You have to know everything. You have to know everything. You have to know a little bit of it. You have to be able to to work uh, in this uh, very open horizon. You have to merge your thoughts. You have to understand this in a way that's more holistic. That's why what I hope is the new education for this, okay? So this is the time that you start to have electric cars and digital twins and powerful computers. And then something happened in neural networks that was another rebirth. You see here, there is a gap. See, there's a gap, you can show the gap. Yes, yeah. This gap I made myself. I, I'm, I'm not sure if I can say there was a second death, but I would say there was a saturation. Everybody was tired of neural networks, too much, okay? But people realize that if you start building neural networks with uh, two, three, four, five layers, it, it does not train. Because when you start to back propagate your error, you multiply by the derivative of the error. And just imagine, if you have an exponential and you take the derivative, you, you multiply by the exponential, okay? So the derivative of an exponential multiplied by an exponential, it's smaller. And then if you take the derivative again, it's another exponential that multiplies the previous one that was an exponential multiplied by another exponential. So every time you multiply by an exponential, it gets smaller, 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 it's squash. That's why it's squash, okay? So as you go inside of the neural networks, the activation to change the weights becomes so ridiculously small that you do not change the weight. So it's very difficult. It was very difficult to train a neural network with more than two hidden layers because anything that was happening in the output did not reach the layers that were inside. And the only way to capture lots of nonlinearities is with more hidden layers. So people got to a time that it's impossible to train a neural network that has too many hidden layers. You have to, you have to remember that in 1969 was something similar. In 1969 was this. I have three layers. I cannot train the middle layer. So there's a depth. Now I have uh, huge data, lots of inputs and outputs, but I cannot train a neural network with more than two layers inside or more than three layers. It was the same problem pretty much. Okay. So people got stuck. But then we had this um, uh, uh, rectified linear neural network, okay? And Hinton here, see 2010, Hinton is one of the persons that published the algorithm in 1985 for backpropagation. He's from the same group, okay? But he continued to work in the network. And I believe, I'm not sure, but I, I believe he still is. I, I don't know, maybe he's still alive. I'm not sure, okay? But in 2010, he had a paper on ratified linear units for deep learning. So he found that using this modification of the transfer function, you could have a way that you could uh, propagate even further in your neural network. So you could go deep inside of a neural network. That's why it's called deep learning. So everybody talks about deep learning. What's deep learning? It's a neural network. Is a neural network that you go deep into into the into the core of the neural network because you have more layers, you have more data, you have more examples. It's more, it's way more difficult to train that. That's why it's called deep 
learn. Okay, so deep learning, even though it became, uh, how to say, very hot, is just a claiming knowledge for a neural network. In addition to that, I don't know if we're going to have time today. There's another thing that happened in the aeronautics and aircraft industry. That was this: I have an aircraft. The aircraft is there on the on, on the on the sky, and Tiago knows that the aircraft on the sky is about to fall. Isn't it? Yes. <laughs> how? <laughs> so how do you avoid to fall? Well, there are several ways. Don't, don't fly. Yeah, don't fly is another is a possibility. <laughs> But they have to avoid that pause, okay? So how can you do that? Well, I have to model that in real time. How can I model that in real time? Well, my aircraft is there and I'm here on the Earth. So I have to have a system that simulates in real time what's happening there. So when you have this, uh, how to say, replication of something that's happening in real time, and you have a control system that's simulating several scenarios that's happening with your control systems, we call digital twin. How the digital twin can take decisions? Well, the digital twin can take decisions with control systems, the digital twin can take decisions with data, okay? And today we are in the 21st century, but we are going back to data. Everybody talks about data, huge data, data science, data learning, everything's data, 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 okay? Just imagine this, Isaac Newton, when he came with the, his laws that became very important for us to study the movement, he proposed physics. In order to propose physics, he had to have uh, derivatives and integrals. So he also had to invent calculus. He is one of the inventors of calculus. Leibniz is another one, but he was one of the inventors of calculus. So before Isaac Newton, everything was data because Kepler was looking to the sky and he was making predictions of how this planet is going there, but he was looking to the data of how the sun goes on this path or how the moon goes that or how Saturn does this. It was an observation of data. And Isaac Newton did that. No, you don't need that. You just need this law here. And with physics, you can do this and you can predict this because you just need the physics, okay? So physics-based modeling was born with Isaac Newton, okay? And it has been with us for a long time. So we use physics, we use chemistry, we use biology, we use equations when you understand. But now with computers, we have data everywhere and a digital twin can take the data of the airplane that's flying with uh, winds or with solar flares whatever data you find a baby's born somewhere maybe that's relevant maybe it's not there is data okay so how we can compile all that data and make sense so we are going back to before isaac newton we are going back to kepler but in the 21st century. So today we have physics-based modeling versus data-driven modeling, but the focus of today in electric cars and power system and smart grid and everything is data-driven modeling. And for data-driven modeling, you need a lot of math and a lot of statistics, a lot of uh, machine learning and neural networks because we try to make sense of this data in a way that help us to take decisions or to model things or to model something or to try to predict something, okay? So I believe that the neural networks and digital twin and very powerful computers, they have a very bright future, a very bright future for many things, including to improve our power grid, including to improve how we are going to integrate renewable energy into the system, including how uh, decisions can be made if uh, a fleet of cars will have to store the batteries in a certain scheduling or such like or something like that. So I believe that mathematics, big linear systems optimization, understanding of algebraic system, understanding how to solve in not only differential equations, but uh, algebraic differential equations, which are very hard to solve. I believe understanding of data analysis, and I believe that a very comprehensive way to, to connect, not only power electronics and power systems, but a very comprehensive way to connect electrical engineering with computer science is the future. That's what I believe. That's great. Just uh, have a, a question. 
we were talking about digital twin and also you want to make us a break yeah how about we have a break so we can relax here a little bit and yes. you come back i don't know if it's going to cut this or not but this is the second segment we're going to stop here's going to save the video and we'll come back for another yes, short let's, talk let's do that okay we are back let's go to the last part of this short talk with professor marcelo about artificial intelligence i have a few questions here professor marcelo you said a lot of the history of artificial intelligence the timeline was good very good with a lot of information it's really interesting to see how things stopped and continued things that has been discovered so you said a little bit about training neural network this is quite normal right in this technology i hear a lot that one of the drawbacks of neural network in power electronics application is that you need to train the system but and people complain that if you need to train something that is connected to the grid, for instance, you may cause instability because you need to train the neural network. It will already connected to the system. This cause maybe a uh, over voltage and may trip some protections, causing instability. Then you said about digital twin. My question is, can you use a digital twin technology to train a neural network for a, a future application that will be grid connected, for instance? Is, is this has uh, does this have uh, fidelity? I mean, can I use the digital twin to train the neural network and really connect with confidence the, in the real system? What do you think? Okay, every time you have a system that is operational and it's uh, complex, it's very difficult to go there and change things to train your case, okay? <clears throat> I'll give you the example that I, I said before. When I studied neural networks, I was in the nuclear engineering department. And I remember that the professors that they said that you cannot go into a nuclear power plant and ask the operator to change this pressure or to change the temperature. To do this. That is going to explode. Because you are <laughs> because you uh, because you are training your season because you, you just can, to see how cannot, it behaves. You right? cannot play around with something that's dangerous. Yes. So no. you can use digital twin. Since you model together perfectly, okay, go ahead. So every time you have a complex system that's operational and it's uh, working 24 hours a day, like a power power grid, you cannot go there and simply disturb that system to see how it reacts and try to find rules or to find data to train your neural network. First, it's not safe. You are going to create a situation that may bring the system to a collapse, may bring the system to unstable situations. And the owner of that, because we, we always have an owner of something, you not want their system to be destroyed or to collapse or to cause any damage or fire or any accident, okay? So we usually train, particularly in the academic situations, we usually train with models. <clears throat> or we usually train with data that was kept. So there is an offline training with a model, or there is an offline training with uh, data. And then little by little that we get uh, used to how that system is working well, one day we're going to find a situation that is safe to insert the system to operate and see if it's capable to replace a controller to improve a control, okay? So this is a way to, to do something offline and incorporate. What you are saying is this, if I have a digital twin, that means I have a plant, I have a system, I have something that behaves in real time, functions in real time, and somehow I have here a computer following the same thing in real time. However, a computer can do calculations, okay? So let's go back to the example of an aircraft. We could talk about uh, military applications, but I really don't like to talk about military applications. But let's say we have a ship or we have something that's moving, okay? And then in your, in your digital twin, you're going to 
make some predictions. For example, there is a storm. Okay, there's a storm in the in the in the in the path of the airplane. There is a storm in the path of the ship. So what's going to happen? Ah, we're going to model using some equations how the ocean will behave, how the atmosphere will behave, and I'm going to predict something, and maybe I'm going to instruct the airplane to go a little higher or a little lower, or maybe I'm going to instruct the ship to go in a certain direction or go into another direction. Okay, so. You can use your digital twin to try to make uh, what if situations. And then these what if situations will give you guidance to the real time control to prevent some catastrophic situations that lie ahead. Okay. You can say, yeah, but something un unpredictable. Okay. Something unpredictable. I would say that you have to have um, uh, unpredictable situations embedded in your control. Okay? Yes. At the most, something protection would trigger yes. and keep your uh, application safe. There are, there are, there are, uh, there is a field where we try to design systems that are fail safe. Okay. When I was really an electronic engineer, because one time in my life I was really an engineer who worked with stuff that will be deployed. Okay, but when I was an electronic engineer, when I just finished my my bachelor's degree, I used to work for automation control of uh, the subway in São Paulo, and the automation control of the a part of the railway that connects the metropolitan train in the city of Sao Paulo, because those are projects from the foundation that I used to work. Okay, so I remember really well that all the circuits should be fail safe. So if it fails, it should fail in a way that's safe for people. It's safe for not creating a catastrophe. It's safe in a certain way that whatever happens is controlled. Okay. So I remember uh, power supplies there, they have to be designed like that. Uh, microprocessors that were in the scene, they have to have duplication, sometimes triplication with ways of voting the decisions to decide, well, maybe the system is not behaving well, so I'm going to get rid of this, I'm going to continue to. So you always have to have a fail safe uh, system. If you have a uh, real time control could be the aircraft that we're talking could be a smart grid or something. You have to have embedded in the design this fail safe application. So probably we're going to have controllers, controllers, give a pause. So you need to have a, a protection system in this case. Yes, a protection system is part of what is a fail system, okay? a fail safe system. Uh, so if you go, that, that's why it's important to go into these technologies of electrification, transportation, because they have to be fail safe. A train cannot get out of the track. A train cannot collide with another one. It's only one track. Okay. Uh, uh, an airplane should be on the air and should uh, and should land safely, and a boat should not uh, turn. So we have to we have to create situations. That are safe, safe for people, safe for the system. There are several things that we have to define as safe. So when we design something that's fail safe, usually you have at least two routes. Sometimes more than two, but you can have two routes. So you have a duplication. But people say that when you do when you have a duplication of something, you don't have much because you can also uh, lose another one. So I remember that people used to say, if you store your data in two places, your, 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 your data is not safe yet. You have to store your data in many places. You have to have a multiplication of your data. Then you have to find exactly what you need. So as you have more paths of duplication, triplication, quadruplication, it's safer because you have more ways to replicate your action in that system. Okay, I would say that a digital twin would be one of these. 
Okay, so if you have something, uh, uh, for example, we always watch these uh, rockets going to the space and we have the control room, okay? The control room has the capability to do a lot of mathematical evaluation of what's happening, but the rocket, if it's uh, it has somebody or has a computer, also has, okay? And a rocket may have people or may not have people. You know, it can go to the to the space with somebody on board or not. So it depends on how safe is safe for you. For example, if a rocket is lifting, is it safe enough that you just abort and the rocket uh, falls down in the ocean? Yeah, maybe that's safe as long as you do not hit something in the ocean. But uh, if the rocket is lifting and you have people inside, then you want to return those people safe. So being safe in that situation is more constraining than being safe with just uh, uh, something that's carry, being carried out to the space, but there has no people. Okay. So the, the definition of fail safe depends on the situation. But what I would say in respect to your questions is, Digital twins are important for these and neural networks are important for that. Yes, they are, but they are part of the solution. Okay, so you have to design your system to have a control actuation. Then you may have like training somewhere. Training could be a neural network, but could be even a common future. You have to have a, something that's being trained and then you insert that thing into the loop. And somehow you can uh, you can uh, control you can change the controller from a main controller that had some kind of problem, maybe feedback or maybe some sensor or something, to another part that still keeps your system in a safe condition. And then you have to decide if you're going to continue the mission or if you're going to abort the mission in a safe situation. Okay. Continue the mission is uh, I have a machine, I have to go from here to there. So there is something happening in the way. So can I still get there? Yes, continue the mission. But now I'm going to the moon. And then something is wrong with my rocket. So fail safe maybe means that I have to uh, escape from that, go into a capsule and come back with the people to the Earth. So as long as your control system is capable to be replaced in this uh, overall parallel way of control, I would say that digital twin is a possibility of doing that because the digital twin maybe would be a supercomputer in a control room that has more capability, more data and more, how to say, real time um, and data capability than something that's uh, on, on, on the way doing something. And we're talking here about aircrafts or ships, but could be something else. Could be, could TV be a smart and wind systems. Could be, yes, could be a, a electrical system. system, a power system, a wind system. Sure. I totally agree with you, Professor Marcelo, and I also think that this kind of technology, the digital twin technology, is also good because you can test your artificial intelligence controller in situations that hardly happen in practice. But your controller must be prepared for that. So you, you have can design from the beginning. Yes. So you can create some situations that would hardly happen in pra in reality, but your controller should be prepared and you can repeat and repeat again this situation in a safety environment. So this I totally agree with you. That's good to know that you can use this technology to train some artificial ne neural network yeah, besides trying directly to the real system. Some people say something. It's not my area, okay? But some people who are concerned about semiconductors, for example, they say that the transistor may fail, the diodes may fail, and then you have to have your motor drive or your converter still working, maybe in a degraded condition, okay? So they call reliability. Reliability is how reliable is a system to do something, okay? So Professor Fred Bloodbeard, he has in his uh, group this reliability group and i remember he said that uh, uh, we have to design systems based on reliability i think it's very nice to have a 
reliability way to design something, something, but we do not teach our students and engineers to do that. Okay, and being fail safe, we also do not teach our engineering students to do that. So, in my perception, as someone who came from the past century <laughs> and I'm living here in this 21st century, is uh, my generation had uh, a lot of things that we see evolved and the new generation, they see things that are already evolved. So they take for granted a few things. For example, they take for granted some solutions that are ready made, but they forget that they need to understand the foundations of that. And sometimes the foundation is a way to design a fail safe system is a way to understand how a controller is implemented. So uh, I believe we have to invest in the electrical engineering education to keep motivating students to come to our profession and still be the professionals that we need for the next century. That's great. That you are now that you are talking about education, I have another question which is quite related to that. Uh, so you are talking about education, okay? So let's suppose that I'm I'm a student who knows uh, power electronics, who knows very well control theory to design linear controllers, non-linear controllers. Okay, I'm I'm a student. I, I know a good break. I have a good background of power electronics and controllers, and I want to start studying artificial neural network or fuzz controllers, in artificial intelligence in general for power electronics application. Do you have some recommendations? Where should I start? Today there are many. Okay, now on the top of my head, I don't remember the names of the books. But um, of course, I'm going to suggest my own book because it's always to start. Okay. Yeah, sure. But this is not the only way. You can maybe take this book and study a few chapters, then at least you understand how to start. But uh, I think you really have to put hands on. Okay. And hands on does not really mean uh, reusing a code. Okay. Because today, in the age of sharing everything on the internet, people believe that with a few clicks, you go there to GitHub and just bring uh, something, or you go to Cabo and just bring a code, and then you run it and you get data from a data repository. And then you see a lead going on and off. But you have to understand what's behind it. So hands on is not really making the thing to work and you just look and say, oh, I'm happy. No, you have to understand. Okay. So in order to really uh, go into the area of uh, neural networks, fuzzy logic, deep learning, artificial intelligence and machine learning, you have to start somewhere. So one way to start is, well, most of people have access to MATLAB, at least in universities. And MATLAB has so many toolboxes and so much videos and things like that. But we have other softwares. Okay? We have Wolfram language. We have so many other simulators. But let's say MATLAB. Okay, So go there into MATLAB and understand the code itself. Uh, if you bring a code from Simulink, do not be happy just using that code. Try to understand what's that box you you took from, from the workspace and put in your Simulink. Try to understand what's the math behind, what's the physics behind. Try to make cases that you try to explore uh, ways that your little block will not work the way that expect. And I always told my students in my life, if something you predict by looking or by your thoughts, you cannot observe in your computer simulation or you cannot observe in your experiment evaluation, you stop. No, do not continue. You stop because you have to explain yourself what's happening. Okay. You cannot accept that something is happening and in your mind you're expecting something else. You, you are doing something, I don't know, you have, uh, I'll give a mechanical example, you, you have a 
you have a, a screw and then you put there in the thread and then you do this with the screwdriver. And let's say that your screw should go inside and should go into another hole that you lock something. Okay, so you're thinking, well, I should do this and then my shaft should lock. Okay, this is a mechanical example, okay? So you have that in your mind and then you get your screw put inside of that hole. And then your shaft, it's kind of held, it's not moving in this direction, but it rotates. Well, that's not a hole. Maybe it's a slot. Maybe your, 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 your screw is going to a slot and doing that. Yeah, but if you just accept, okay, I was expecting to be locked and it's rotating. Why? You have to explain why. How can you do it? Well, you can disassemble and see that instead of a hole, you have a slot. Or you make uh, imagination. Use your imagination. Everything in your life starts with you imagining something, doing the conceptual work in your in your brain, and maybe have a piece of paper. People today do not like to draw. You know, you have to draw. You take a pen and you take a piece of paper. And you draw. You make a diagram and you make an explanation. You know? Richard Feynman said that uh, if you really want to prove that you know something. Explain to a 10 years old. If the 10 years old can understand it because you, you understood. If the 10 years old cannot understand it because you cannot even understand, because you cannot explain <laughs> to a 10 years old guy. Okay. So That's try good. to explain people. That's good. No, not try to explain to a scientist. Try to explain to a young child. <laughs> <laughs> if he, he or she who is 10 or 11 does not understand, is your explanation not good? Is your explanation not how to say foundation enough? Or maybe you do not know, and you do not have the courage. Yeah, you need to know how to transmit this knowledge, right? Because yeah. Because maybe you know inside you, you know how to deal with that, but you know how to transmit. That's why it's important, for example, in research labs, for students to collaborate, to cooperate, to talk, you know, to share, because... Uh, you practice that skill, right? Oh, yeah, okay. because today, even though, if you think, oh, I'm going to do a PhD, I want to publish and everything, and I want to be successful. I want to have an age index of 500. <laughs> Let's say that's your intention to have an age index of 500. Okay, good luck. Okay, but uh, you have to get there. In order to get there, you have to understand what you're doing. Okay, so uh, I would say that uh, when you want to learn artificial intelligence or you want to learn fuzzy logic, or when you want to learn how to just, I don't know, take care of a machine or something, you have to understand what's behind that. You have to explain. And if something's happened that it's not in accordance to what you expected, you wrote a code. We are just talking about this today. You wrote a code and your lab blinks every one second. One, And then somebody's gonna tell you, well, make this two to do one off, one off. I just expanded the period. Try to write that. If it doesn't work, stop. Something's wrong in our code. Maybe there is a, a if condition, maybe there is something, maybe there's a timer that I don't know just took the saturation and, and didn't reset. You have to understand. If something does not follow what you initially predict, because if that doesn't happen, you do not know what you're doing actually. And people today, they just accepting something without being sure that what they're doing is correct. So that's my only recommendation. Take something from the basic, from the foundations, try to understand the math, the physics. Every time something does not behave the way that you expected, stop. Try to explain yourself. Try to explain somebody else. If something is very difficult, make a presentation. People should make more presentations. You know, so people should do more seminars. Have weekly seminars. You know how to do this, how to do that. You know, teach each other, share with each other, because this is the way that knowledge resonates and knowledge sticks. Okay? The way that we keep knowledge is sharing knowledge. That's great.
Do you know some applications of power electronics that most use artificial intelligence? Like we saw, we see a lot of applications, right? Since uh, electrical vehicle uh, topologies, since photovoltaic systems, active filters, we see that uh, artificial intelligence is quite widespread in these applications. But what's your opinion about what you see the most use of artificial intelligence? Is there any or you can find anywhere? OK, microgrids. Uh, today, this terminology artificial intelligence became so common that everybody talks about AI. Okay. Uh, even when you have a family conversation, eventually wife and sister or uncle, somebody talks about AI and somebody says anything about artificial intelligence, becomes very, I would say, common in our daily lives, this discussion of AI. And you always have uh, videos of robots. Yes, yeah, so we have a lot of movies. Lots People of talk movies. a lot. Exactly. So it became kind of uh, some people are afraid of AI, stuff like that. You know, AI will replace the humans. So this is philosophy. I, I don't want to go into that direction. But yes. I would say that uh, as an engineer, and you want to do a research or a career relevant to AI, you have to first understand the algorithm you want to uh, implement and you have to understand where they will be implemented and then you do your design step by step uh, and uh, for example Thiago just asked me where we have most of the applications I have been following AI for the past 30 years of my life for a little bit, I kind of left it behind a little bit. I did something else, but uh, I always did something. Okay, so I have seen a lot of research, a lot of papers, and a lot of discussions. But on the last few years, many of them do not motivate me because I believe that people just try to duplicate efforts or just do things to have one paper published. So that's not really motivates me, okay? So do not try the trivial, do not try the obvious. So some people say, ah, I have a PI controller. I'm gonna use a fuzzy logical neural network. This was done. This was done 30 years ago, don't do it, okay? I have a boost converter with artificial intelligence. Boost converter. Why do you need the boost converter? Okay, if it's a it's if it's a course project, it's fine. But this is not the research, okay? So you have to do something that's meaningful. You have to do something that matters, okay? So easy things have been done. So you have to be brave enough to do new things. And how do you know that you're doing new things? Uh, sometimes you need uh, a little bit of intuition also yeah, in our life. Sometimes we need intuition, have, we have a perception of something is good or not. Okay, But I have, I have been reading or sometimes not reading, but just looking at papers that use AI for uh, electric vehicles or PV electric or PV systems. Some are nice, some are repetitions, some are duplications, some some of them I read I have already done in some kind of fashion before. I don't know. Uh, maybe a company will have something that is AI based, but they will never publicize that's AI based, you know, because they do not want to say all the secrets of the trade. Okay. And some researchers they want to say that anything is AI. You go to LinkedIn. There is a little bit automation of a pick and place robot. They say that's artificial intelligence. It's not artificial intelligence, that's control system. Ah, there is a camera that looks the apple and puts the apple on the crate of the apples in the orange on the crate of orange. And this AI, this is not AI. You have a machine that goes on the farm and then you take the, the fruits and do something, slice the fruits and they go, they go into their um, containers and go to the supermarket. They say that's AI, but it's not AI. This is something called marketing. Marketing people are like that. You know, they like 
to do marketing. They like to say something that's way beyond them, the whole thing. If the hype and the terminology that people make uh, uh, pretend it's better is AI, it's AI. I don't know. Maybe in 10 years, it's not going to be AI. It's BC. It's going to be DE or whatever letter. Okay. So do not be, how to say, do not go with the wave. Do not follow, lead it, do something, even if it's different, be brave and do with a scientific engineering technological way and foundation that supports what you're doing. That's what matters. And trust what you're doing and be true. Okay. Because when you are true to yourself and true to what you believe, you're going to do something that matters. And this is best than doing something that is just because it's a, is a, how to say, is hot or it's a wave. Do not try to do something that's hot. Everybody's doing. Try to do something that matters with uh, consistency and scientific support, mathematic formulation, physics formulation, computational formulation and in a way that whatever you model and predict, you can observe and you can explain. That's good. It's difficult to talk about prediction, but do you have any, anything in mind that what could be the next findings in artificial intelligence, in power electronics applications? Is there any direction of new contributions? Can you see that? That's difficult to, to yeah. see, of course. Well, uh, I saw something that caught my what attention. What is the most promising field to be used artificial intelligence in power electronics? Okay. I I have several things that I like. Okay. Uh, even though I'm not uh, uh, electrical machines person, I like electrical machines. I like electrical machines modeling. And I gave up. I tried. I gave up to have a neural network model for an induction motor, for example. Why? We have the equations. Uh, those five differential equations, they, they are nonlinear, they model the induction motor. So we don't need to. For any, for any application, any range of speed, any range of torque for everything? Or, or you can. The modeling of induction motor works really well. Yes. Yeah. Maybe you could go into more details about saturation or a thing, but you know, for but, most but, of the machines, it works well. So yes, okay. why do I need a neural network for that? Okay, so I gave up on that. But there are a few things that uh, caught my attention the last few months. For example, if you want to design a transformer, simple transformer, okay? There are some equations that you use to design a transformer that, that were, uh, that were made available in the beginning of century, okay? And it's to use the same equations, and people do not uh, question those equations. Okay, so there are uh, researchers today that believe that maybe neural networks could be important for design new magnetics, particularly because now we have uh, silicon carbide, we have the possibility of working with high temperature. And magnetics will not work well in high temperature. So how can I attach magnetics and capacitors in circuits that will work in very high temperatures if they do not work in high temperature? So I believe that this idea of passive components that you go to extreme conditions and maybe fail, if there is a way to make the design of systems using neural networks or using data training or using uh, some kind of, uh, how to say, data-driven modeling, can I make new systems? So I believe that we have very soon, you know, a new technology of new components based on this uh, wide band gap device, high temperature, with uh, newer versions of passive components that operate in high temperature. And we may need modeling and analytics that we didn't have before. And in that situation, probably neural networks, fuzzy logic, and even digital twin will help us. That's great. Thank you. 
just say to us uh, some final words, then you can conclude the interview. If you can say good words as final words. Okay. My my final words would be uh, like this. If you watch this video, which became very long, <laughs> congratulations. Okay, you got to this point. Or if you just skip to this point, maybe you can go back and watch the whole video. So I would say that uh, love what you do and do what you love. And try to not be concerned too much about uh, how very fast you're going to be famous or how very fast you're going to have a very high impact factor citations and things like that, because this comes with time. As long as in, that you believe in uh, what you're doing and you're patient for things to get mature and maturity, you know, you're going to see, you know, there is a time for 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 seeding the, the soil. There's a time for the plants to grow and there is a time for harvesting. The time for harvesting is where you take your is where you take what came from the land. And that takes time because the nature needs to respond to you. Our life is the same. We have to invest in our life. Think on the long term. Okay. Think on something that we believe is important and thinking very seriously. Be very serious. Be very true to what you are doing, very true to what your studies are supporting, what you're doing right now. And eventually, in a few years, you are going to be recognized for what you did. Thank you very much, Professor Marcel, for this talk. It was my pleasure to hear from you a lot of things about artificial intelligence applications your career we could make another interview just to talk about your career or what you did in your life it would be a pleasure to hear from you so thank you very okay. much thank you thank you okay. bye bye see you bye bye everyone